Made in Abyss, The Golden City of the Scorching Sun is the long-awaited sequel series to Made in Abyss and its follow-up feature film, The Dawn of the Deep Soul. The original series was one of, if not the, best anime of 2017. Widely adored for its wholesome story of innocent youthful adventure, and definitely not because it lulls you into a false sense of security before exposing you to new levels of visceral suffering you didn't even think possible within the realms of animation. When I covered the series on this channel last year, I made it clear just how much I adored it. But five years is a long time to wait, so it was with some anxiety that I went into the new series, worried that it couldn't live up to the high bar set by season one. Long story short, it does. Made in Abyss season two is a magnificent ride, and a great follow up to where we left the story. Though not a perfect sequel, it still manages to recapture both the wonder and the horror of the first season, while both building on the characters we already care about and introducing plenty of new elements into the story. And that's what this video is going to largely be about, because by introducing those new elements, there's a change in how the narrative of Made in Abyss is structured, making it a little less straightforward. So this is part recap, part explanation, and part review of one of this year's most anticipated seasons of anime. A follow-up to a groundbreaking adventure series with epic visuals, masterful world building, endearing heroes, terrifying villains, a soundtrack of non-stop bangers, and a central compelling mystery which reveals more about you, the viewer, than it does the characters. So the stage is set, the hype is real, let's dive back into the abyss with the first new episode of the second season- OH MY GOD! Like, I know this show has a reputation for being shockingly dark, but at least season one made the effort to, you know, butter me up for ten episodes before going full sicko mode. This is scene one, episode one, and it's not even that YouTube won't allow me to show this, I personally don't want to show this. Which admittedly is not a great start to this video, but I've got to draw the line somewhere. This is how the story introduces us to Voiko, another poor, unfortunate orphan girl leaving her life behind and setting out towards the abyss. Unlike Rico though, Voiko doesn't know exactly where it is she's headed. You see, after escaping her abuser, Voiko joined the divinely touched Wazakian, the beautiful and principled Belaf, and their ragtag bunch of misfits. Guided by Voiko's star compass, remember that thing? In search of the legendary city of gold, together they form the, and I'm not making this up, Ganja Suicide Squad. Which means that the events of this story are literally brought to you by Gangweed. 10 out of 10, anime of the year. However, what the Ganja Gang don't know is that these cities of gold lie at the bottom of the abyss on Orth Island. And the reason that they don't know that is because Orth, as we know it, doesn't actually exist yet. Instead, it's populated by an older tribal settlement where they pick up one last outcast, a young girl abandoned by the natives called Irumiri. That's right, not only are these events taking place before Rico and Reg's descent, they're taking place before Orth was even founded. Which begs the questions, what became of these explorers and how is their story relevant to the Rico squad in the present? Speaking of the Rico Squad, you're probably wondering where the hell they are. Well, in episode one, all we really see is that they're on their way to the sixth layer, where we left them at the end of the movie. You'd think with such little screen time dedicated to our main characters, we'd be spared from any unnecessary scenes like, oh, I don't know, Rico awkwardly taking a dump in the middle of an elevator? But Akahito Tsukushi is an author with, let's say, questionable priorities. It isn't until episode 2 where we really catch up with Rico, Reg and Nanachi, and catching up feels like the most appropriate description. The focus is on reacquainting us with the lead trio, so aside from the Prushka whistle going missing, the story is put on the back burner to spotlight their interactions. As a fan, I really just appreciate getting to see these three after so long, and it shows how distinctly their personalities are written when they can just bounce off each other for a full episode without much else really going on. Makes you think that in another life this anime could have been a really comfy slice of life show if, you know, it wasn't for the small detail that it's written by a deeply disturbed psychopath. 
It's in episode 3 where the plot starts to kick into gear, as a search for Prushka leads the gang to this weird village populated by hollows, who've settled into this strange isolated community outside of the influence of the curse. The gang meet Magic Adger, a four-legged robot hollow thing whose actual body is made of smells and the metal casing is just a vessel. Smells are a recurring theme this season for some reason, and it's never really that easy to discern whether that's thematically important in some way or if it's just Sakushi being a weirdo. So while I won't mention it, just imagine that all the characters are always talking about how nice they all smell. Like all the time. Constantly. Anyway, Magikaja acts as a village guide, both to the characters and to us, taking the gang to where Prushka is being whittled down into a true white whistle, and to the marketplace where Riko spots a note from her mother, Liza, for sale. Magikaja then explains how the economy of the city works, which is pretty key to the whole season really. Everything brought into the city has a price based on how much is valued by its owner, so an item of high sentimental value is worth more than one that isn't. Items can be traded for the city's magical floaty currency, or for body parts. Because in this place, something costing an arm and a leg isn't just a saying. Good joke! In fact, Magic Adger suggests that Rico could trade her eyes or her skin for the letter, because in this village, children's body parts are the most valuable commodity. Just like in the real world! Kaja also explains that the Hollows who live in the city are unable to leave, and that their bodies reflect their deepest desires, which makes me wonder what exactly this dude was after when he transformed. But yeah, the villagers are all like weird fetish perverts. One of them likes being stepped on by fluffy animals. Sakushi. One likes slicing cute things up. Sakushi. One likes liquid pipes running through his body. Sakushi. Once they've left the market, Rico is separated from Mania when a hollow starts to squeeze her until she drops lifelessly to the ground. Naturally, Rico is distraught, which introduces our second chapter of Abyss City Economics 101, the balancing. You see, the city innately knows how much someone values their items, so has a way of redistributing wealth to anybody left out of pocket by scams, theft or damages. Because this stupid pink fuck damaged Mania, and because Mania was of extreme personal value to Rico, this stupid pink fuck now owes Rico a shit ton of money, and the balancing will make sure that he pays. Like demonic loan sharks, the balancing strips him of everything he owns, and when he can't pay materials, it starts taking body parts. All immediately converted into... Dogecoin? And given to Rico. Also, yeah, Mania's fine, actually, but now at least the gang can afford somewhere to rest and eat. Hey, look at this gross food. Wouldn't it be funny if it gave Rico the runs and, uh-oh, stinky, poo-poo, ha-ha. We're three episodes in, and this is the second scene involving Rico shitting. I'm gonna need to start, like, keeping a tally or something. Who still puts corner tallies in their videos in this day and age? I do. Is something outlandish gonna make it freak out and explode? Well, you'll just have to wait and see, won't you? The arrival of Fapta, the physical embodiment of value and princess of the hollows and terrible names, causes a huge commotion within the village. Nanachi and Reg suspect she has something to do with Prushka being taken, so Reg goes to investigate while Nanachi searches for water to help Rico with her... predicament. So this is an exposition heavy episode, and something I notice is that the expository dialogue is pretty dry when it's coming from a character with as little personality as Magic Adja. For comparison, in Season 1, a lot of the information came from Rico, the protagonist, the driving force behind the story. She's naturally engaging, so when we learn something about the Abyss from her, we learn more about Rico in turn. Conversely, Ozen had this uneasy, intimidating aura, even when she was just explaining the lore. Magikaja doesn't really have any of that. All in all, he's pretty dull. So his exposition just feels like the story stopping dead in its tracks to explain itself, which is just a lot less elegant than season 1's info drops. Anyway, Reg glimpses a fragment of a memory suggesting that he already knows Fapta from his mysterious amnesia clouded past. She confirms his suspicions, but only in the most vague, unhelpful way possible, which turns out is a bit of a character trait, as is her ending every sentence with the word Sosu. This is one of those things that's really endearing when an animated character does it so soon, but if anyone attempted it in real life so soon, it would be very difficult to resist the urge to punch them into the ground until they're a patchy brown stain so soon. 
It's got big, I'm so quirky, deviant art energy. Although, perhaps a slightly more concerning aspect of Fapta's behaviour is her stabbing Reg in the belly button and then tasting his blood and trying to peek his dick to make sure that he's the real Reg. That also has big deviant art energy, but not for the same reasons. While she's out finding water for Rico, Nanachi hears from Magikadja that Mitty is with Bailaf. You know, that guy from hundreds of years ago? And not in an all hollows go to heaven sense, no, like literally their house is up the street, which is a little bit distracting for Nanachi. With Reg and Nanachi gone, Rico has the room to herself, which naturally leads into the third chapter of her haha funny poo poo character arc, commenting on how the toilets in the city are alive and that they lick your butt clean. God almighty give me strength. When he wrote The Lord of the Rings, J.R.R. Tolkien wasn't really much of a fiction writer. He was an academic, he was professor of Anglo-Saxon language at Oxford University, and in his spare time he would create fictional languages for races like elves and orcs and hobbits. Lord of the Rings was really his attempt to give a structure to those fictional cultures and customs which would make them accessible to people who weren't linguistic nerds like he was. So in a way, Tolkien ended up creating one of the greatest fantasy stories of all time, almost by accident. And the more I see of Made in Abyss, the more I think that Sakushi is sort of in that same boat. Except, replace Professor of Anglo-Saxon Language with Massive Fucking Pervert, and replace fictional cultures and customs and languages with Weird Fetish Shit, and that's basically where we are today. So, when Rico sets out to find her friends, she gets cornered in a dark back alley by a bunch of freaks in a scene that's about as uncomfortable as you would expect from this story. Luckily, she gets rescued by Ma, the pink guy from earlier, and Rico's would-be attackers get shredded by the balancing. I think the balancing might be my favourite character. Rico then goes to get something to eat and bumps into Wazikian, but he looks a little bit different. Narachi also reaches Belaf, but he looks a little bit different. What is this, Alolan Onyx? If someone's able to let me know if that's a good joke, I'd really appreciate that because I haven't played Pokemon in about 15 years. But most importantly, Mitty's there, who, you know, definitely shouldn't be. Released by Fapta, Reg heads back to the city but gets attacked by the wildlife. You'll note that the dragon is CGI and actually looks pretty good, but I definitely do miss that ragged scraggly art style for the dangerous monsters from season one. Reg is rescued by Fapta's big daddy robot Gabaroon, who explains that he's one of a series of robots sent to collect data from the Abyss, but that the others stopped responding years ago, and he hints that he and Reg might share the same creator. At the restaurant, Mugi, the owner, tells Rico about the deep mysterious hole at the edge of town said to contain the city's secrets. Yeah, I think she might have heard this one before. Yo, what up? I heard you like abysses, so we put an abyss in your abyss so you can descend while you descend. Rico charges into the pit, like Amegara Fault style, and finds Voiko and the balancing blobs. Voiko offers to help find Reg and Nanachi, but she can't leave the pit unless somebody frees her. She's been in prison there for initially opposing the village, but has since changed her mind and now values the city, it's becoming blah blah blah. Rico doesn't give a shit, she's got friends to find. And that is exactly the sort of reckless abandon I can get behind. I wish more protagonists were like, I don't give a shit about your backstory, I have a plot to progress. Voiko takes Rico and Ma to Bailaf's house, where they learn that Nanachi has sold herself to Bailaf in order to buy Mitty's freedom. Capitalism, am I right? We also see how Mitty got down there, and, like everything, it's fucking Bondrude's fault. Back before Nanachi and Mitty escaped him, he took Mitty down to the sixth layer and displayed her immortality to Bailaf. Seeing her as an eternal food source, Bailaf tried to bargain for Mitty, but couldn't convince Bondrude to sell. So instead, he sacrificed parts of his body to manifest a copy of her within the village. Which apparently is just like an option that he had. And now in order to buy Nanachi's freedom back, Bailaf demands a similar sacrifice from Rico. Either her eyes, her legs, or her organs. <laughs> Capitalism, am I right? While ruminating on a way to help Nanachi, Voiko explains a backstory to Mugi and Magikadja. Which, you know, considering she's been around since the founding of the city and has observed everything in silent immortality, should probably be quite a big deal to them. But they have no reaction whatsoever. I assume, living in this city, they're probably used to this weird kind of shit. Rico then gets distracted by a giant creature attacking the city and heading towards the shop where they left Prushka. The Beetleman hands Prushka back, now a finely crafted white whistle, and the scene 
could have ended there, but instead it leaves us with the Beatles saying this. In the first shock. This is why I make videos about this show, because how am I supposed to discuss this with normal people in real life? Magic Adja explains that because Hollows can't leave the city, they have to lure monsters in if they want resources. When the strongest Hollow, Jeroimo, gets overpowered, Rico hatches a plan to confuse the monster using its own reflection and Kadja's badass race body. allowing the villagers to trap it. Everyone thinks that the creature is dead, but in one final attack it grabs Ma. Rico receives a sensation from Prushka and blows her, which probably could have been worded better in this script, and in an instant the monster's tentacles are sliced and Reg reveals himself shiny and chrome, showing that the White Whistle unlocks his true powers. Now episode 7 is where the story starts to get really interesting, as we head back to the past to check in with Gangweed. Voiko and the outcasts settle into life within the abyss, but they need fresh water, and given the wildlife and the curse of the abyss, limits them to just a single source. The native girl, Iramui, now basically adopted by Voiko, falls ill and reveals she was once adored by her tribe, but when they learn that she was infertile, they cast her out. They don't explain how exactly they knew the kid this young was infertile, but given this show, I'd rather not know. Let's, let's move on. After a few days, more people become ill, with their limbs becoming warped and mutated, and Bailaf determines it's the water they're drinking that's causing it. A team of hunters returns to the village, heavily deformed, and die, leaving a strange egg that resembles a star compass among their findings. The robots explain that star compasses are relics which can manifest someone's wishes, but because adult desires tend to be complex and messed up by worldly thoughts, it's safer to let children use them. When Iramui's body starts to deteriorate, in desperation, Voiko and Wazakan entrust the compass to her, hoping that her innocent desires will stop the disease. And she does, and they all live happily ever after. No, of course not! Voiko awakes to find Iramui feeling better, though her arm is still mangled and the compass is fused to her body. Everyone else is still ill, so they have no idea what Iramui wished for, and while she no longer experiences pain, her body continues to break down, leaving Voiko confused and terrified. The next day, the village learns of Iramui's wish, as her mutilated body gives birth to a short-lived misshapen facsimile of a being, not even born with the organs needed to survive. Despite escaping her old village, Iramui's deepest desire was still to be able to give birth. The trauma of her upbringing had corrupted this child's wish, and her body twists and distorts as each day she gives birth to another husk of a creature. Just a reminder, this is the show that the guy from Heroes wants to turn into a Hollywood blockbuster. Fucking go for it, it's gonna be a train wreck, I cannot wait. Eventually too, Waco succumbs to the illness, losing the strength to care for Iramui and is nursed back to health by Wazukian and his all-purpose mystery stew. Okay, so episode 7 is pretty intense, so let's lighten the mood and see what Reg's up to with the fluffy moth girl. Okay, back to Voiko. When she comes to, Voiko realises that what Wazikan has been feeding the sick is Iramui's children, and the fresher the newborns, the better. Just like in the real world! This revelation drives Bailaf insane, and as Voiko tries to comfort Iramui, she wonders why she hasn't gone crazy herself. Her guilt over consuming Iramui's children is immeasurable, yet if she stops eating, she'll die, and if she dies, no one will be around to care for Iramui. Trapped in this living hell, Voiko longs to be punished for her actions, but she can't imagine any punishment greater than simply continuing to live in this endless horrific cycle. Which in my opinion is the single most horrific concept this story has ever presented. Forget the gore, forget the body horror, Voiko praying for punishment to absolve her misdeeds, only to realise that being trapped in her life 
is her punishment is genuine terror. Wazukan reveals that he tampered with Irimui's wish by fusing her with a second compass while Voiko was out ill, and with her transformation complete, Irimui leads the Ganja Gang deeper into the abyss, morphing the survivors into their new hollow forms, with Wazukan proclaiming it as their salvation. Not drinking the Kool-Aid, Voiko is, understandably, just fucking done. She attempts to end her life and scupper Wazukan's plans, as they both know that without Voiko's comforting presence, Iramui will probably die. But as she's about to fall, Wazukan stops her, exposing the third compass he used on himself, and he traps Voiko inside Iramui's body, keeping them connected eternally. Before finally becoming the Golden City, Iramui gives birth to her final child, Fapta. Born of the three wish-granting compasses, compassi, and inheriting all her mother's fury and frustration at the betrayal and injustice of her existence, and sworn to destroy the city and end Iramui's suffering. And this ties us back into Reg receiving one of Fapta's arms to trade for Nanachi's freedom in return for helping Fapta get into the city so she can enact her plan. So all this jumping back and forth I think is a good place to address some of the structural changes to the storytelling between the two seasons of Made in Abyss. If you saw my video on season 1, you'll know I made a big deal of its focus on linearity, and how it benefits the story. We essentially start at the top of the pit with Rico and Reg, and follow those same characters in the same direction for 90-ish percent of the story. This is really easy for an audience to follow because we never have to think about how they ended up where they are or where things are in relation to each other. Every episode, Rico and Reg are in the same hole, just a little bit deeper than last time. Season 2, that doesn't happen. Not only does the whole season take place on a single layer of the abyss, it also splits the party up, with the main trio each having individual plot lines, seeing them travel to and fro between locations. On top of losing that simple linearity and momentum, it also introduces a second narrative set in the past, setting up a bunch of characters and ramifications which will impact the main story in the present. And that jumping back and forth between locations, characters and timelines makes this second season harder to follow than the first. And this isn't a complaint, it's more of an observation. I praised Season 1 for taking advantage of that clear directional format because it makes the story easy to follow and get invested in, but by Season 2 it doesn't have to work as hard to get the audience on board. We're already here because we like this story and we like these characters, we don't have to be convinced. So I don't think it's an issue that it isn't as straightforward as Season 1, but I do think it's something interesting to take note of from a story structure standpoint. So Reg returns to the city with his arm full of arm, and tells Rico and Voiko about his promise to Fapta. With what she's learned about Wazikan, Rico determines that he's probably trying to manipulate her into using a star compass so that he can leave the city. Without warning, Wazikan appears, striking up some small talk and asking Rico how she feels about the city, to which she says this. Really, Rico? This city? Where they stole Prushka? Where Mania nearly died? Where they coerced Nanachi into selling her soul? Where you nearly got molested in an alleyway? You like this city, right? But before anyone's able to question her stupid answer, Joroimo emerges and attacks Reg. In the confusion, Wazukian snatches Voiko, which nobody notices, and explains to her that Joroimo attacked because he can detect Fapta's body and is trying to protect the city. He also explains that Joroimo isn't a hollow that came from a person like the rest of them, but that he's a being purely of Iramui's making, and also the manifestation of Waiko's abuser that Iramui psychically intuited from her and then birthed. I don't know, this bit's really confusing, but what's important is that he's part of the city's internal defences. So even if he destroys Reg and Fapta's arm, he won't be affected by the balancing. In fact, they're helping him to lock down the city, which Wazakian seems to be into. Desperate, Reg lets off an incinerator blast which rips through both Joroimo and the city wall. Before he passes out from exhaustion, Reg entrusts Rico's safety to the Hollows, then collapses. But Fapta is already there, now fully healed and fully ready to eradicate the city. Elsewhere, whilst she slept, Bailaf imbued Nanachi with his memories of Irimui, Vueko and Wazakian, so that they can live on after Fapta kills him, then releases Nanachi from her bond. Which sort of makes Reg's whole ordeal pointless to, you know, go and retrieve Fapta's arm, but who are we to question Bailaf's fifth dimensional suicide attempt? 
Balaf informs Nanachi that because the Mitty clone was created by the city, if they cross beyond the boundary, she will cease to exist. So Nanachi tearfully takes her friend across the threshold, freeing her from her pain. Nanachi's story this season is really the biggest red flag for me. Mitty's death in season 1 was such a tragic yet beautifully executed moment that to go back and put Nanachi through that same suffering again feels a little cheap. It's just a much less effective retreading of a character arc we've already seen. So not only does it not really tell us anything new about her character, it also incapacitates her for most of the season. One of the best characters in the show, and for most of the season, she's asleep. The first time around, the decision to end Mitty's pain was a shockingly raw and emotional development because until that point, Nanachi had seemed like this remarkably calm and collected character who was unfazed by the horrors of the Abyss. But in asking Reg to help end Mitty's life, something she couldn't do alone, it showed how vulnerable she really could be. And that is real character development. This time around, it's more like, hey, you know what's sadder than Mitty dying? Two Mitty's dying. And Nanachi putting Mitty out of her pain goes from something that was raw and shocking to something that's a foregone conclusion. Because of course she's going to help put Mitty out of her pain. We've all watched Made in Abyss before. This is just a lesser version of reaching a conclusion to a character arc that we've already seen. Like overall, don't get me wrong, I absolutely loved this season, but for what it did to Nanachi and Mitty, yeah, not a big fan of that. When Reg wakes up, he finds Fapta massacring the villagers and resolves to stop her. Naturally, her opening move is to fist his entire mouth, because of course, this could never just be a normal fight. And now seems like the perfect time to plug this season's Made in Abyss perfume. Scented like Fapta's arse. No, I'm not making that up. I wish I was, but this is a product that has been approved, manufactured and sold. And if I have to live with that knowledge, so do you. There you go, folks. That's called setup and payoff. So Wazakan does this weird thing and gets a new face, but I really don't know what to make of that, so let's ignore it. Rico gives Reg a power-up, but as he fights Fapta, he experiences more snippets of their time together. And although he has the upper hand, the flood of memories causes him to hesitate, allowing Fapta to turn the tide. With Reg dealt with, Fapta then sets her sights on Rico, who she blames for turning Reg against her. But before she's able to deal the killing blow, Gabaroon takes the hit, trying to stop Fapta from doing something she'll live to regret. It's then that Nanachi arrives just in time, alongside Balaf, who, in his dying moments, imbues Fapta with his memories of Iramui and Vueko, hoping that seeing the memories of the mother she never knew will bring Fapta some closure. Nanachi deduces that Wazikan's plan is to use the Star Compass from Fapta's body to corrupt Rico as he did Iramui transforming her into a new city that will allow him to delve deeper into the abyss. Fearing his safety now that Fapta knows about him, Big Waz retreats deeper into the city. Predatory creatures pour into the city through the blast hole and start killing the hollows. Seeing this, Fapta embraces the rage of every try-hard wannabe 13-year-old Call of Duty pro and starts attacking them for kill stealing. This doesn't exactly go to plan though and she's quickly overpowered and badly injured. In a reversal of Iramui's fate, the Hollows give back to Fapta, feeding her parts of their bodies to help her heal. Now even stronger than before, and reflecting on the memories from Balaf, Fapta starts to consider that there might be much more to the world that she just doesn't understand, and maybe more to life than her quest for vengeance, then resumes her assault on the creatures attacking the city. Elsewhere, Rico and crew discover a weakened Wazakan, but no Vueko. In Rico, Wazakan sees the same determination to explore the abyss he once had, and in his final words warns them that what lies at the bottom of the pit is something far more terrifying than worth any reward. But Rico is quick to dismiss his warning. I'll be honest, I'm not a huge fan of the like 5D all according to Keikaku type of villain that Waz was clearly written as. Also, he was kind of a dick and a religious nutcase, so like, rip bozo, not gonna miss ya. Fapta's shrieks then call all the Hollows towards her, while Team Rico plan their escape from the city. They exchange parting gifts and last words. Mugi gives Rico the note from Liza she saw in the market, Rico thanks Ma for staying with her this whole time, and Pakoyan vows to stay behind and look for Vueko. We then find Vueko already making her way back up to Fapta, admiring Rico's decisiveness and bemoaning just how passively she's lived her own life, reminiscing on the few moments she did decide to take action and how much she treasures those few precious memories. 
But Voiko's made a rookie error. Have you spotted it? Do you see what it is yet? Yeah, she took the fucking stairs. That has never worked out for anyone on this show. Don't take the stairs! With the city compromised, it's now being exposed to the Abyss's forces, meaning that travelling upwards now activates the Sixth Layer's curse, breaking down Voiko's body into a gooey pile of flesh. Pako Yan finds Voiko and throws her down the stairs to halt the transformation, but it's too late. And now exposed to the outside world, Pako Yan herself is destroyed. Voiko is rescued by Nanachi, who now realises it's a race against time to get everyone out of the city. Reg takes over the fighting from Fapta, and Riko blows her whistle and then faints. The remaining villagers offer their bodies and their value over to Fapta, as she vows to bring the city crashing down, crushing the creatures and finally ending Iramui's torment. Reg fights his way outside, and discovers that the creatures were crossing over a bridge laid by Wazakyan. He brings it down while Fapta unleashes her powers, finally destroying the city. As she dies, Voiko realises that if she was affected by the curse, then she must have been human up until that point, meaning that one of Iramui's wishes all those years ago was simply to keep Voiko safe and by her side. Reg catches Fapta as she falls, and Riko gifts Ma a stuffed toy to make up for those he lost when they met. As they're escaping, Magikaja is incapacitated, so he does this strange thing where he uh, possesses Fapta's body, but it's weird and it's confusing and it doesn't really go anywhere, so let's just ignore it. By the time Riko awakens, they've escaped. The beasts are all gone, and Magikaja and Ma have died. In her final moments, Voiko meets Fapta for the one and only time, telling her all she can about Iramui. The four survivors then bury Voiko, as Kevin Penkin's score swells to a crescendo that sounds an awful lot like that song from the Hercules Disney movie. Cause I'm the only one that I know where I belong. I would go most anywhere to feel like I belong. So here's a MIDI version of that to play us out for this final paragraph. Reg begs Fapta to come with them, spilling his heart to her, but she declines. With her objective complete and still processing her new experiences, she's learned just how ignorant she is of the world around her. For now, she wants to continue Gabrin's legacy of observing and learning. But that's just for now. In the meantime, she'll consider his offer. And so with that, our heroes move on to the next layer of the Abyss. So, that's a wrap. Thanks for watching Made in Abyss Season 2. See you in 2028, and don't forget to pre-order your Faptas perfume. So overall, this was a pretty great season. It would have been so easy for them to fumble the story, especially coming off the hype and the weight from Season 1, especially with them bringing in so many new characters and changes, but for the most part, they really nailed it. Selfishly, I wish we got some more new information about Liza and Bondrude. They're two of the most enigmatic characters and have been built up so well, but we only get the odd mention of them here and there. However, that's not what this season was about. If you judge the season on its own content, there are still issues, mostly around how Nanachi's story was handled. Like I said, I think it's cheap to go over the same story beats again, especially when it doesn't add anything substantial to her character and takes her out of the story for so long. I'm also not wild about all the new characters. I get that Wazakan's like this deep seeing prophet kind of guy whose goals are beyond our comprehension, but as the closest thing we get to a villain this season, it just makes his methods and his scheme seem really ill defined. Bondrude and Ozen felt like impending threats simply being around the heroes. Wazakan just sort of lightly gestures towards being nefarious, but we're never really sure like how or why. Also, Magikadja is kind of just too boring a character to be given that much exposition so early in the season. Other than that though, I absolutely loved everything about this season. Fapta, Voiko and Gabaroon were all amazing additions to the story. This season was so easily able to fit back into that groove with Riko, Reg and Nanachi where we left them last time, reminding us why we love these characters so much while juggling everything else. Even though we didn't get to see as much of the Abyss geographically as last season, spending every episode in Layer 6 allowed the story to explore it in so much more detail. And in going back and showing us the history, not just of the Golden City, but of the island as well, they didn't skimp out on that world building that Tsukushi does so well. Also, I have to mention just how incredible this season looks and sounds. 
It's so easy to take for granted with the high bar made in Abyss set for itself, but Kinema Citrus and Kevin Penkin knock it out of the park every single episode. Thematically, I appreciate how the story continues to weave the central themes of the story around the world of the characters. The first season did that incredible job of blending the compulsion of the characters to discover the Abyss's secrets with the audience's need to crack open the show's mysteries. As they were pulled deeper into the unknown, risking life, limb and sanity, we willed them on every step of the way overlooking the horrific suffering the story put them through in order to obtain that next nugget of the lore. Season 2 takes those same themes but plays with them in different ways as part of the city. It questions what the characters are searching for, what they value and channeling that into the value based economy, and how even innocent desires like Iremui's can be completely corrupted. It also plays with that sensation of longing for a purpose which underpins the entire narrative and is best shown through Vueco. And Made in Abyss didn't need to do any of this. It already demonstrated that it had a winning formula with season one. Nobody would have complained about another season of Rico, Reg and Nanachi diving headfirst into another half dozen layers of the Abyss. But as much as I've made fun of him for his eccentricities, it shows Sakushi's ambition to shake up the structure of the narrative so much and his skill to pull it off as incredibly as he has done. And that is the sort of storytelling that fills me with confidence to see where this anime goes in another five years or something. Because we've more or less caught up with the manga at this point. Which means that we're going to be waiting a while before there's even enough material to start thinking about adapting to TV. But hey, longing for that thing that's always just beyond your reach and slowly being driven mad by the inexorable weight? Well that's just part of the Maiden Abyss experience. Well, that and all the weird fetish stuff involving under it. What happened to Blaze Reap? Because in the first season, they built it up as this important weapon from Liza, but they only used it one time. Then they brought it back for the movie, so I thought, hey, now it's going to be more significant this time around, but it's not even shown at all in season two. And it's not exactly the most inconspicuous weapon, so what, did they just lose it? What was happening with Magikadja possessing Fapta? That comes out of absolutely nowhere right at the end of the story and it is such a tonally weird thing to put in there. Like all the other characters are either dead or mourning the dead and then Kaji just reveals that he can like possess people for one scene and one scene only. I am sure there must have been a less goofy thing that would have worked better in that moment. What happened to the birthday disease? Remember at the end of season one where they set up this thing where like kids were dying on their birthdays but once you took them off the island they got better? It was this dangling thread that they seem to be setting up but in season two we hear zilch so like i thought we were going to get something but what happened how exactly does the economy of the golden city work we get told that kids bodies are the most valued commodity there but like why belaf offers to trade nanachi's freedom for rico's legs eyes or organs but like what the fuck is he gonna do with them once he has them i suppose he could consider them food just like in the real world but I'll leave those questions with you. Thanks for watching, I'll see you next time.